welcome to theheart.org. Uh, my name is Professor Tony Gerschlich. I'm here in Munich at the ESC uh, sessions. Uh, today we're again uh, visiting the hotline and late breaking sessions and uh, I'm honoured to be seated with Jörg uh, Tenberg who's uh, one of the Co PIs or co PIs? Yeah, I am. Of uh, an important study uh, that looks at uh, aspirin or no aspirin in patients undergoing PCI who are already taking oral anticoagulations. Very important group. Yep. We know that triple uh, uh, antithrombotic antiplatelet therapy has a very high bleeding risk. Yep, and so it's an elderly population, increasing numbers of atrial fibrillation increasing numbers on uh, warfarin and other uh, anticoagulants. These are patients we see not that often, but increasingly so perhaps. Yep. And we don't know, I have this debate in my head the whole time, am I going to give them warfarin and aspirin, warfarin clopidogrel, warfarin aspirin clopidogrel. Same with us. Yeah. Yeah, so, yep. very important study and may not answer all the questions, but maybe answers some of them. So, give us some of the background over and above that which I've already stated. Well, as you, as you say, we, we, we don't know the optimal antiplatelet treatment in those uh, patients. Uh, as the guidelines state, we have to administer and coumadin and aspirin and clopidogrel, but it leads to, to many bleeds, and as you know, bleeds is uh, related to, to mortality. So we hypothesized that we could leave out aspirin in those patients. Um, so the, it was a superior uh, a, a trial designed in a superior fashion, uh, to prove that the double therapy group, so Coumadin and Clopidogrel alone, mm. uh, leads to less bleedings, but mm. at the same time does not increase the risk of thrombotic so events. This is very important, though, but you decided on the Coumadin and Warfarin, or what Coumadin and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Clopidogrel, Clopidogrel yeah. um, because you felt that for stent thrombosis, the clopidogrel was That's more important than aspirin. Yeah, is that, is uh, that, that, that was one reason. It, I, I think we as interventional cardiologists, are, we do not want to discontinue clopidogrel. We, we yeah, think it's absolutely. more effective to yeah. prevent stent thrombosis. The other reason might be that, that aspirin probably leads to a little bit more gastrointestinal bleeding. Yeah. And that's the most frequent bleeding in those patients. And some of the cure data, of course, originally, the bleeding rates related to the dose of aspirin. So yep. there definitely is an aspirin. There is an aspirin effect. relation, yeah. Okay, an aspirin. So tell us uh, about the study. Who was involved, how many patients, and how they were selected, yep. and uh, how they were randomized. And then we'll get on to the okay. absence. Okay, so, so as said, all those patients were on chronic Coumadin. Uh, most of the patients were AFIT patients, 70% of the patients. 10% uh, of the patients had Coumadin for mechanical valves, and there's the rest, uh, patients with uh, severely diminished left ventricular function, for instance. Um, in total, 573 patients, uh, randomized in 15 hospitals in the Netherlands and in Belgium. And How did you get your power calculation? Uh, we, that was from, the, from a retrospective um, uh, registry, the largest one. Uh, the, in the incidence rate uh, in that study was 12% of bleeds. And we uh, anticipated a lower bleeding rate, of course, in the double group, uh, to 5%. Okay, so you went 12% to 5%, and that gave you 80%, 90%? 80% power, power, power yeah. for and 570 patients overall or in each group? Overall. 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 Okay. Yeah. So they, these 570 patients, all of them are on Coumadin. Yes. Were randomly allocated to clopidogrel alone. Clopidogrel alone is open, open study. Open, open, open. So clopidogrel alone versus clopidogrel, uh, clopidogrel and aspirin. Okay. Yeah. So that's a very yeah. important study. And your primary endpoint? The primary endpoint was Timmy bleeding. Okay. Yeah. All Timmy bleeding at one year. Okay, so, and the demographics, how old were the patients? Uh, the patients were, the mean age was 70, mostly male. Uh, as I said, I, I think it's a high risk population. So, so many patients with diabetes, uh, so 30% had previous cabbage or PCI. For instance, 17% of those patients had a uh, previous history of stroke. Right. Um, and um, 
about 25% of those patients had an acute coronary syndrome. So this is quite important. The business about stroke is quite important because the yep. other option is to stop the warfarin. Yeah, well, uh, that uh, might uh, be an option. Uh, and, yeah. so, and you may not want to do that, particularly for the 10% who had mechanical Yeah, uh, but reasons. maybe in the other, the atrial AFib, um, you could have stopped it. But as you, if you look at the data from the, the retrospective uh, studies, what, what is obvious, if you stop the Coumadin, the incidence of, of strokes yes. goes up yeah. significantly. So, so I, I don't think that's an option. I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an attractive option, but no. it may be an option that people consider rather than think about might stent be. It thrombus. might be in very low risk patients. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, uh, about uh, how the study was conducted and then the results. So I said the patients were random, uh, independent, yeah, it was an uh, investigator-driven study, so there was, there was no financing at all from industry or whatsoever. Um, as I said, patients were followed for one year and um, in the outpatient clinics as well as by telephone interview. Um, so in the end, the, the primary endpoint turned out to be significantly lower in the double group. We anticipated, of course, a lower incidence of bleedings, mm -hmm. but it was a huge difference. It was 44.9% in the triple group and 19.5% wow. in the double group, wow. so a huge difference. So four times, almost four times the incidence that you predicted in the triple group. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that's, that, uh, that is a little bit surprising, but yeah. I guess this, this wow. study was especially developed to pick up bleedings, but do you well, know and that's that different to, to the retrospective um, uh, registries. But there's data out there that says 45% bleeding in triple group, so yeah. you know you shouldn't be that uh, surprised in a trial that you get those sorts of results. Yeah, yeah, you got more bleeds in the double group than you're anticipating, from five well, to 19%. Yeah, percent, also, but there's still also, a huge, yeah. you can, must be a, a big p-value. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so that's the bleeding. And did you break the bleeding down into? Yep. Uh, obviously, you did Timmy, but uh, yeah, Timmy major hemorrhage. And, uh, yeah, there were, was no difference in intracranial hemorrhage. So both were on Coumadin, of course, but it was a, a similar incident. Uh, Timmy major bleeding was numerically lower in the double group. Yeah. It doesn't reach, didn't reach a statistical significance, okay. but it was a significant difference in Timmy uh, minor and minimal. Okay. Bleedings. Okay. So these are and these if you look at the the location of the bleedings, it is especially as you said gastrointestinal bleedings, yes. uh, procedural related bleedings, access site and exercise, uh, exercise site and and uh, hematomas, yeah. skin hematomas, for instance, for which the patients discontinued the medication. Yeah, that's always a yeah. worry about stent thrombosis. Yeah, so a very important. But what about? What about uh, ischemic differences? You know, one group don't have aspirin. Did it make any difference? Well, that, that, that was really a surprise to us. We anticipated a slightly higher incidence of, for instance, stent thrombosis, uh, AMI, uh, but it turned to be uh, the other way around. So the double group had a lower incidence of stent thrombosis, a lower incidence of myocardial infarction, a lower incidence of stroke, target vessel revascularization, which was also in the secondary endpoint, the composite yeah. of thrombotic events, was similar not surprising to me, it's not a thrombotic event, I guess. Uh, and there was a, a striking difference in mortality. So in the, in the triple group, it was 6.2%. In the double group, it was 2.6%. And that mortality relates to the bleeding? Um, well, what, to what do you know? Have you done the analysis? It, it's not, no, we, did, we did, didn't do the analysis. It's not uh, directly related to bleeding. I, I do not know the exact reason for mortality, to be honest, really, really but there might be some some bleeding in it. Yes. I mean, small bleedings lead to discontinuation of medication. Yeah, yeah. They might lead, as, as we've seen in Atlas II, for instance, a similar finding. They might lead to uh, AMI, uh, yeah. heart failure. Patient could pick up, for instance, uh, uh, pneumonia and die of pneumonia. So, yeah, what yeah. is the cause of, the, of death in, in this patient? So and whether or not it relates to dis bleeding and, in, and discontinuation of yeah. the of the treatment as a yeah. result of yeah. the of the minor bleed or whatever. Yeah. Really important. So, a couple of important questions as we come to the end of this this conversation. What do you do after one year? Um, well. I, I think that the first question is what do you do after stenting? Are you confident with the data and, and, and do you change your practice? I mean, uh, if you ask an interventional cardiologist, do you uh, discontinue aspirin in these patients? He obviously will say no. 
but I think that these data will will change our practice and, and we leave out aspirin. And what do you do afterwards? That's a tough question. Um, um, I think that most of the data have shown that if patients have to use Coumadin, there's no need for aspirin anymore, I mean for coronary disease. Yeah, but they're not um, on the, what the, 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 the aspirin has a long-term preventative effect, we know that. You know, what, what people will say, I suspect, looking at this data is, wow, we have at least some answer yep. now, and if we're going to do anything, we would consider stopping the aspirin. That's what this data, I yep. suspect, will lead to. I agree. What they'll ask you, or what I'm asking you is, after one year, we, should you swap the clopidogrel out and put the aspirin back, aspirin plus warfarin, for the longer term uh, cardio yeah, protection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, I, I, I think there's not much difference between clopidogrel and aspirin. Okay, but we shouldn't uh, we, make we any recommendations because we haven't we, done We the haven't study. done the study, but so, from the complete trial, I would say it's, it's quite equivalent. So I would okay. not change the medication after a year, but... Uh, Personally, I think I would. I have no data at all. I think I would. If I'm now presenting with a patient on on uh, oral anticoagulation, he's coming for stenting. You know, we've all looked for an option. We had a trial of factors that was mm -hmm. going to that uh, come to fruition. Similar sort of study where you could or couldn't stop the anti uh, anticoagulant. But if I we haven't got that study, we've got your data. I suspect that most people will now think about stopping the aspirin for a year, then maybe replacing it back again, mm -hmm. but uh, very might interesting, be, be. fascinating data, uh, a real uh, benchmark in terms of management, which would be congratulated for Thank undertaking you. and for great results. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.